Hello Rob, welcome back to our YouTube channel. Now we are doing our kitchen interview in English. <laughs> um, therefore I would like to introduce yourself, ask to introduce yourself to our audience again. Who are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my name is Rob. Um, so I'm originally from the UK, but I've been living in Switzerland now for uh, just over 15 years. Um, I first moved here to work with a, uh, a local family office, uh, but I think after about two years in 2006, I set up uh, RV Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, um, it was purely a sort of a, a consultancy. I had the, the dream of running my own fund, but faced the chicken and egg problem that many of your uh, viewers, I'm sure, will be familiar with, that um, without capital, it's difficult to start a fund, but without a fund, it's difficult to attract capital. Um, mm -hmm. So for the first two years, I was consulting for different uh, family offices. Um, also a company, I think, um, and I had my sort of lucky break in 2008 where uh, the Rentrop family very kindly supported me and started the business owner fund. Uh, so since, uh, since 2008, my, my sole occupation has been uh, managing the fund. New, you are now running the fund for 10 years. That's right, yeah. Congratulations to the anniversary. Thank you. I'd rather be 10 years younger. But <laughs> <laughs> and how does a typical investment year of you look like? Um, you mean how I kind of spend the time yeah. or? Um, yeah, so I guess um, in terms of um, how I spend my time, um, you know, there's a part of the activity or an important part of the activity, which is sort of desk-based, um, um, you know, kind of reading, uh, reading annual reports, um, primary information on companies, making notes, I keep a journal on all of the companies which I, which I follow. Um, I usually build uh, a model, um, uh, not so much to, to value the company, but more just to make sure that I've understood the mechanics uh, of the business. Um, so that's the kind of the desk-based side of the research. And then the other side is, um, you know, I, I love uh, um, to visit companies. I was saying it's very important for the investment process. So once I get to a certain point with the desk research, that I think an idea is sufficiently interesting, I'll normally um, get on the train or an airplane uh, to go and visit the company and, you know, kick the tires, um, meet with the management uh, and that kind of thing. You're also going to foreign countries to explore them? Yes. Yeah, so I'm completely opportunistic uh, about where a, a company is based. Uh, you know, some investors have a certain geographic focus, like on a particular country or continent or whatever. For me, I'm completely indifferent to where, where a company is. Uh, the certain characteristics I look for an investment, which we, we can talk about, but provided that they're there, I'm indifferent whether a company is based in Germany, in America, or in China, South Africa, uh, whatever. You've grown your assets under management from 10 to, I think, 220, 250 million mm -hmm. um, with a great track record. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very good track record and inflows. How does this change in the amount of money you're taking care of changed you or not changed you? Um, well, I think it hasn't made a whole lot of difference so far. Um, you know, there was, um, I've never really marketed the fund. And, um, you know, I think when the fund started back in 2008, there was probably around seven investors. Um, and I would guess that on average, um, every year, probably roughly seven investors have join the fund um, and there hasn't really been much difference in that maybe there was slightly less joining in the earlier years slightly more today but it's there's never been a big rush and and you know even today there's probably less than 100 investors uh, invested in the fund so um, it started as a club and and still today it is a club and in terms of the the capital um, you know i think the the vast amount the mass the, the majority of the capital has come not from people investing new capital, but from the, the performance of the existing uh, investments. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think in my first full year as a fund, uh, you know, the fund started, I think, at around seven or eight million euros and um, had uh, I think 20 or 30 percent uh, performance. So, you know, 20 percent of seven million is less than two million. Whereas today, based on 200 million, if I do, if I have a 20 percent return, um, you know, that's 40 million. So. <laughs> It makes quite a big difference, although the um, you know the the, um, the percentages are the same. So you know the capital has really come from from the performance rather than from from people. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of how I invest, um, I've always found my sweet spot to be companies which have a market cap of around about you know somewhere between one to three uh, billion. 
I don't like it when companies are, are too small because it means either they have um, uh, a very short track record or they have a long, very mediocre track record. Um, on the other hand, I'm not so keen if companies are too large as oftentimes the um, um, you know the the opportunity for growth has, has has gone to a certain extent. Not in all cases, but but oftentimes. So for me, the sweet spot has always been in the roundabout the sort of the the one billion euro market cap space. And um, with the amount of capital I manage today, there's no real um, restrictions. So there's no limiting through the amount of capital you currently have. Well, you know, the, the stock market is a kind of a pyramid with the largest companies mm -hmm. at the top. And then the further down the pyramid you go, the more companies mm -hmm. they are and the smaller. And so the more capital you have, obviously, the more you move towards the apex of the, the pyramid and mm -hmm. the less opportunity there is. But, you know, I still find there's, there's plenty of opportunity for me. And one advantage of being a little bit bigger today is, you know, I have very close relationships with a lot of the managers that I'm um, or, or companies that I'm invested in. And by being a bigger part of the capital base for them, I can, you know, my voice maybe has uh, has a little bit uh, greater weight. And so I think that's that's definitely an advantage. How do you deal with mistakes? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've always, um, you know, prior, before the fund started, um, you know, I learned investing not by um, working Uh, at a fund management company or, or, or for somebody else, but really by managing my own money. Um, you know, so it all started in the early 2000s um, when there was the big sort of dot-com crash and I started with a very simple but effective methodology of buying a lot of the really beaten up companies which were trading below the net cash they had on their, their balance sheet. Um, but since day one, because I was managing my own money, I was always trying to figure out, you know, on the one hand, how to avoid active mistakes, uh, and then on the other hand, how to do even better next um, within with future investments. And that's kind of natural if it's if it's your own money, you know, you're not reporting to, to anybody else. Um, you know, it's it's fairly obvious, intuitive that you want to avoid mistakes and get better. Um, and so it's always been a really big part of my methodology to make an investment based on a certain investment hypothesis and then later to look back on that investment and see how it did and you know where i could do better uh, the next time and then of course you know if i scoot forward to 2008 i started managing other people's money alongside my own um, but the structure remained the same it's it's just me uh, doing it and my mentality is also the same as when it was just my own money of trying to kind of figure out how to permanently uh, get better and um, you know, I think it's quite easy to do that if you're not in a big corporate structure mm -hmm. where there's people jostling p for position maybe with the ambition to to be you know to to occupy your your place or whatever um, you know so I think um, the kind of the smaller setup that I have is much more conducive to um, you know to being open to 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 learn from mistakes than maybe in a, a larger corporate setting What do you define as mistakes? Um, you know, so in the very early days, I made some very obvious mistakes of commission. So I, I bought some companies uh, based on a very simplistic balance sheet analysis, um, you know, trading at a big discount to book value. And um, a handful of those, you know, went bankrupt or went to zero. Mm -hmm. And that was simply because um, I had not really gone beyond a, a balance sheet analysis in, in analyzing the companies. So obviously, I was very keen to eliminate that type of mistake early on, and um, I think that's uh, I've achieved that to a certain extent. But the much more common type of mistake is actually missing out um, on good opportunities, so mistakes of omission. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my focus over the last 10 years, and, and I talk about it a lot in my letter, is, is figuring out, okay, what can I do differently in the future um, to get you know better results? Then... I will also link your letters below <laughs> so that people can read about it. In your letters, you also said you had a deficit in, in the investment thesis of some stocks like Novo Nordisk or Baidu. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell more about this deficit you saw and why you sold the stocks? Yeah, so th they were two investments um, which did reasonably well for me, but certainly, um, certainly didn't live up to my, my full expectations. Yeah. You know, so. My investment hypothesis, and, and of course, most of the time, hypotheses uh, don't work. But the hypothesis, when I make an investment, is always, you know, this is a wonderful company, which is going to grow for a very long period of time. And by 
remaining an owner um, uh, of the company, I'm going to participate in that uh, value creation. Um, that's always the hypothesis. Uh, but of course, you know, things don't always work out that way. And, you know, in the case of Novo Nordisk, um, what I think I overlooked was that there was a too great a dependency on raising prices through achieving growth as opposed to, um, you know, helping people by, by selling, um, selling more insulin. And um, that became clear to me over time. And, um, you know, that was uh, the reason that I sold that company. And um, in the case of Baidu, which is the kind of the Google of China, it's a search engine company. Um, you know, my, my hypothesis there as well was that um, in the Baidu, you know, at the time, the Chinese internet was a little bit behind the, the Western European internet, mm. could effectively replicate the success Google had in, in the rest of the world uh, in China. And al although Baidu still does reasonably well as a business today, it's nothing, you know, it's a, it's a shadow of Google. It's, um, you know, it um, hasn't achieved anything, anything like what, what Google has achieved. And the reason for that is that um, its search results are not particularly good. Um, and in particular, they tend to be uh, quite commercial. So for example, uh, Baidu owns um, a food delivery platform or it used to own a food delivery platform. And so if you search for food delivery on, on Baidu, you would find its own services, but not, not the other ones. Um, and that might make sense in the, the short term because obviously it generated traffic for its own service. To my mind, it doesn't make sense in the longer run because you have effectively uh, a service that people don't trust. And if they don't trust it, they don't go to it with the same frequency and automatism that we would, for example, go to, uh, to Google. And so when I, when I realized that the, um, the search quality uh, was not um, as good as I would, would hope, um, uh, that's when I basically made the decision to, to sell it. Yeah. Looking at the Chinese internet stocks, uh, where do you see the most, the biggest quality in these stocks or in the, the companies? Um, you know, the, the Chinese internet is a fascinating place because it's kind of gone off in a very different direction to, um, to where the Western internet has gone. Um, and there's two very dominant players. One is Tencent, um, which is kind of, uh, has the dominant social network in China, which is called uh, Weixin or, or we, WeChat. Um, but it goes far beyond, for example, Facebook. It's not just a social network. It has payment. It has all kinds of services um, which people can um, can use through through its app. So it's um, it's a much more expansive company than Facebook is. And the other one is, of course, Alibaba, which is a kind of a mixture of um, Amazon and eBay, and um, and also has a very dominant payment service. So they're the two kind of very very high high quality uh, companies, I would say. And then in the second row, there's lots of kind of niche, niche companies covering certain uh, verticals or service requirements. Um, so there's, there's a lot, lot of interesting companies there. Thank you for the insight. In your letters, you said that uh, the acting people or the management yeah. became more and more important to you. Yeah. Why is that so? Yeah. So, you know, when, when you start out as an investor, obviously, um, you know, you, you know, rightly place a lot of an emphasis on your analytical ability. So you try and understand what a company does and analyze the various um, risks involved in all of the different um, parts of its activity and then form an, uh, form an opinion on whether it's a good investment based on, those, um, based on that analysis. Um, but what I realized over time was that, um, although I do my best to be a, a diligent analyst, um, you know, a lot of the stuff you don't really see from, from the outside in a company. And what I kind of realized was where the companies were being run by people I liked and trust, I found the stuff I didn't see was generally positive. And in the companies where um, um, it was being run by people who I you know, didn't trust or thought weren't particularly good people, a lot of the surprises were, were negative. And, and so I kind of drew the conclusion from that, that um, although it's important to be uh, an, a, dil a diligent and thorough analyst, by far the most important aspect of an investment to get right is trusting um, the people who are running the, the company. So, um, you know, that's by far the most important factor that I that I look for when I'm analyzing a, a company as a potential investment. What makes a management good and trustable? Um, you know, the vast, the vast majority of managers, uh, it's very difficult to say one way and another. You know, so if, if you think about it as a, as a sort of a, a bell curve or, or, or a distribution, you know, you kind of, 
you have the vast majority in the middle of the bell curve and it's very difficult to say one way or another, are they good, are they bad, uh, um, you know, are they honest or are they dishonest? You know, I, I just don't know, I might have an opinion, but that opinion would most likely be as often wrong as right. And then you have kind of the two extremes of the bell curve. You have managers who are very obviously um, dishonest, um, uh, misaligned, unmotivated. And of course you wanna avoid those like the plague. Um, and then at the other um, at the other end of the bell curve, there's there's managers where it's completely obvious that the company constitutes their life's work. They they have a passion for the business. It's the center of their lives. Um, and of course, it's those guys that that you really want to focus on and not get distracted too much by all the other stuff. So, what tools do you use to filter all these good managers and the people you trust? And what psychology insights you maybe use? Yeah, so you know, um, I understand the question, but I think um, by far the most important factor is actually to to really decide for yourself that this is the most important factor you're looking for. Um, if you decide this is the thing you look for in investment, then it completely changes your psychology about how you approach a company, how you approach an analysis, how you decide which which companies to, to dive deeper on and which not to. So I think by far the most important thing is actually to decide for yourself really uh, deeply that this is what you want to focus on. And if, if you do that, I kind of think, you know, kind of 90% percent of the, the hard work is, is actually um, done. But then of course, you know, your question is, you know, having decided this is what you want to focus on, what are the, the you mm -hmm. know, the kind of the factors um, to look right. for? And it's, it's kind of quite obvious stuff, you know, so if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for a company where it constitutes the manager's life's work, then obviously that person most likely has a very long, long period of time where they've worked at the company. They may very well be the founder or have started at a very, at the company at a very early stage in their mm -hmm. career. Um, you know, so it's kind of very, very obvious stuff like that. You mentioned the positive surprises you have when yeah. you invest in a company with good management and people you can trust. Yeah. One of your investments is Kränke. Do you yeah. have it in your fund for like from the beginning on? Yeah. Can you maybe tell a bit about the positive surprises you had there to give some more light on this? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of examples that occur to me. So, um, you know, um, Grenke is a, um, is a German company which does so-called small ticket IT leasing. So if a company wants to buy, you know, say two or three laptops, um, maybe 5,000 euros, they have the choice of paying in cash, getting a bank loan, oh. or doing a leasing contract. And Grenko would be the company that they would hopefully go to if they decide to, to do a lease. And like all financial companies, um, Grenko was under a lot of pressure in the financial crisis back in 2008 and 2009. And whilst, um, you know, some companies went under in that period, some companies tr trod water and some companies became much more valuable. And, um, you know, Grenka was definitely the case of a company which became much more valuable. Just to pick one example, in early 2009, they bought a bank out of bankruptcy, a small Hamburg-based uh, bank, um, paid almost nothing for it. Um, and that gave them the, the possibility to immediately gain the ability to take in deposits. And over time, they used the bank as well for various other things, um, uh, including making uh, making loans. And so that's something that I certainly would have predicted if you'd asked me if it was going to happen in 2007. But it's the type of positive surprise that does happen when you align yourself with um, you know managers who are thinking from the perspective of um, the, from the perspective of an owner. Are there any other good examples you can recommend to look at? When management is good, besides all, it could be also besides your fund investments where you, where you haven't invested and saw great management. So an example of a characteristic yeah. or an example of a manager? Of a manager. Of a Nothing. manager. Well, you know, there's so many. I mean, um, I haven't invested in Starbucks, but, you know, I think Howard Schultz is someone who clearly has an incredible passion for, for Starbucks and, you know, he has a deep love for the company. Um, you know, love is not a word that you often find being used in financial circles, but that's actually what you're really, what you're really looking for. And, and there it's kind of, you know, very obvious uh, in him. And, you know, there's a ton of other examples as well. For, in, uh, for instance, like what examples? <laughs> um, let me think. Um, for sure. 
No, so I mean, you know, um, yeah, no, but I think I could almost mention any of my investments, um, but, um, uh, you know, I'm invested in this company in Seattle called Trupanion, um, mm-hmm. which does pet insurance. And there too, it's, you know, they it was set up by uh, Daryl Rawlings um, uh, many years ago. You know, he's still today one of the largest shareholders. He runs the business. It's clearly the absolute center of, of his life. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's, when you look for it, there's, you find quite a lot of it out there. Yeah. Thank you for the example for the management. You're also talking about corporate or sort of co- corporate culture. Mm-hmm. What's your definition of this and what is a good corporate culture for you? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think culture is incredibly important for companies. Um, you know, the way culture works is, um, you know, it, it kind of provides a, a kind of um, guideline or a sort of an, an operating manual for employees of what they should do when it's not clear what they should do. So, you know, for example, Amazon is a company where, um, um, you know, the cust- customer service is really at the center of its culture. And so even if there's a specific um, case where an employee doesn't know what they should do, they can always refer back to the company's values and its culture. Okay, what would be the most customer friendly to do? And so it kind of provides them with a, a guide with guidelines on what to do. So culture is, is, is super important. You know, but where does culture come from? You know, culture ultimately comes from the values and the personality uh, of the founder. Um, and so that's why, you know, the kind of the, the, the leading people in a company and, and the culture I kind of view as almost quite uh, inter- interchangeable. Interesting. Maybe to s- sum up our discussion, a bit controversial question. Yeah. <laughs> And one of your holdings, Facebook, when they, mm-hmm. where I have the, the gut feeling that I can't trust the management um, because you know, there are a lot of stories about data privacy and yeah. things they obviously in my eyes lied. So how do you see Facebook From the management perspective no i mean you know so i'm facebook is one of my largest investments so as, as you can imagine i i kind of disagree with that um, um with that and um but you know i think i think mark zuckerberg is one of the most sort of purpose and mission driven mm-hmm. people i've ever come across um, um if he's made a mistake it's probably that he's been he's believed too dogmatically uh, in his vision and you know the vision he had was of By connecting people, you would create this more open um, and you know better world, uh, I guess. And um, you know that's been the guiding principle of the company since since the very beginning. And um, you know I think it was a mission that a lot of people would have agreed with a few years ago. So when you had the Arab Spring and you know what appeared to be the case of sort of the the smaller people being able to rise up against an oppressive regime through the tools of social media, people took a very kind of positive view on that openness mm-hmm. and connectedness. And then more recently over the last couple of years, um, you know, kind of the bad guys, if you will, have caught up and they've also figured out ways to use mm-hmm. that openness and connectedness to, um, you know, to to spread hate, to influence elections and, and that kind of thing. And that's obviously, um, you know, a terrible thing. Um, but I would argue very strongly, I think, that that's been a result of, um, you know, people effectively exploiting the mission of the company and the company was too slow to, to notice this was happening and it's received criticism for that quite correctly. Um, but, you know, I think their heart is in, in the right place and um, it's really um, probably nobody would have guessed it would become such a large and powerful company in such a, a short space of time and how, um, you know, people who believe very firmly in free speech would change their minds so quickly that, certain types of speech should be actively censored and, and suppressed. So, you know, things have moved incredibly quickly. Society's values have changed quite quickly and the company has been sort of caught in the middle of that. But, you know, I don't doubt for a minute that, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, heart is kind of in the right place. In this case, you need also, you need to maybe change also culture in the company and you need also reflexity. How does reflexity play a role in your process? Yeah, I mean, in this case, I think the culture or the values of the company do have to adapt, right? Because um, people thought the more open and connected the world is, the better the place it's going to be. And that belief has unfortunately been shown not to be 100% correct. I think it is 
largely correct, but it's not 100% correct. And those minority of cases where that openness leads to you know, crime and interference with election and stuff, that's a price that society is not willing to, to pay for all the good stuff that's happened. So you know, the company has to, to adapt to that and um, um, adapt its values um, more towards kind of safety and privacy in, in addition to kind of connectedness. Um, so it definitely requires some change and, and the company's doing that. Um, but, you know, I think we're pretty lucky to have someone like Mark Zuckerberg there who, who clearly is no longer financially motivated. He's already I think, sufficiently wealthy that that can be can be ruled out. So he, he really, I think, is trying to do do the right thing. And, you know, we're lucky it's someone like that who's in this position, such a position as opposed to someone with a very active political agenda, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, abuse that position of power that they're in. Thank you very much for this open and insightful interview. <laughs> Thank you.